Well, we heard Casio Dad, which was Jay's earlier project on our college radio station, and I liked it immediately, as sometimes happens with me and music. Uh, you show you show you heard it on the radio station. Mm -hmm. You showed like it fall. to me while we were doing a play together, and you were like, "I'm really into this. Like, you should check this out." And I remember you showing it to me and me being like, oh, "Okay." <laughs> <laughs> but then I, um, when I. Ended up being Facebook friends with you for some reason that neither of us can remember. I saw you posting pictures of you <laughs> at shows, like with a guitar and stuff, and I was like, oh, oh, uh, shit, is this person a musician? Um, so I reached out to you and I was like, I, I almost remember exactly word for word. I was like, hey, I don't know how we became friends on Facebook, but I'm seeing a lot of posts from you. Do you know who I am? Because I don't know you. <laughs> Um, uh, and then that turned into uh, us like talking about moving out to Cal mm -hmm. California. I was like, uh, and you mentioned you were looking for a roommate, yep. or for roommates, and uh, and then you told me that your the music project you do is Casio Dad. Mm -hmm. So when you told me that, I went into the living room with Jonas, we and I was like, together, yeah. I was like, hey, can you look up a band camp for me? And I was like, oh yeah, sure, <laughs> oh, yeah. sure. And sure. I was Maybe like, cool. uh, and I was like, Casio Dad. <laughs> <laughs> Literally, I want to I want to make sure we know that is exactly how you said it yeah. too. I'm um, Casio Dad. And then Jonas was like, "Oh, you mean Casio Dad?" And I was like, "What do you What do you mean? What do I mean? <laughs> <laughs> what, what do you mean? Do, don't I mean?" It's like, "Oh yeah, yeah. I showed I showed you them like two months ago." Yeah. <laughs> and then we were like, "Oh shit! Like we gotta." Be roommates with this mm -hmm. person and join their band. Yeah. Like we we have. Well, that you were trying to the joining a... the band happened. No, later. no, 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 no. It, it happened later. Oh. But we were talking about it. Then. Oh, really? I mean, on yeah. the drive to California. It, it was uh -huh. like a, if this works out, it'd be cool. On the drive to California, Jonas uh, <laughs> played your album over and played played. Um, uh, he's, he's not with us anymore. Yeah. Over and over again, so we could learn the songs, <laughs> so that if you asked us to be in your band, we'd be like, oh yeah, sure. Hi, I am Jay from the band Glass Beach. I sing and play keyboards and guitar and some other things. Hi, I'm William. I'm the drummer for Glass Beach. I, I also do backup vocals and um, and I think that's about I think that's about all I do for this band. Right? Hello. Don't you like hit things sometimes? Like play drums? Yeah. I said that. No, you didn't. I'm sorry I said hello before you were there. <laughs> <laughs> I did I did though. Um yeah, hello. Who are you? I, I'm Jonas. <laughs> I'm the bassist for Glass Beach. Uh, sometimes Jay lets me sing and occasionally even yell. Yeah. Four. Track one, Classic Jay Dies and Goes to Hell Part One, was probably the track that took the longest it was one of the first ones I wrote and one of the last ones we finished. Yeah. Yeah, I remember I remember doing a bunch of like different well, you you doing a bunch of different versions, showing them to us and like continuing to ask us like what like what what's missing? What can we do? Did you mm -hmm. like this version more? Did you like the last version more? <laughs> um, which happened with a couple songs on the album. Um specifically just like over and over again getting demos. Um and then eventually I yeah, like you pulled us into the practice space and we're like, can we just like hit this for a while and yeah. see what mm -hmm. comes of it. And I remember that being very helpful, but not ending up being like anything we used. Part one was also one of two songs that we got uh, our friend Tony Sanders mm -hmm. to play trumpet on. He is mm -hmm. a ridiculously skilled trumpet player. And yeah. we, did ne we did Neon Glow first and that had a pretty simple part, but mm -hmm. After he like knocked it out of the park with that, I was like, <laughs> okay, for part one, I want to like arrange something that'll really show off his skills. I remember getting a hold of him for um, for that song, getting him to record the trumpet part for it, and um, him getting back and saying like, well, this is certainly more complicated than the last uh -huh. one you sent me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And he was like, I, I'll try to have it back to you in a couple weeks. I was like, okay, cool, yeah. Mm -hmm. like, wait, well, you got it, you got it. Yeah, and um, he did, he got it. He did. He did, you got it. So the drums for part one was like one of the last things we recorded, right? 
Yes. And when we went to record the drums, we realized we, we were missing like some connector. Or yeah, we were missing something. We were missing the the the, the um, power the, for I your think mixer. The power for the mixer. We basically ended up not being able to use the full drum mic set that we had used to record everything else. So we ended up recording it with two mics. We had we had oh, a. I we had a condenser mic, like the same one that I was using for vocals, behind the drum set for a room sound. And then we had, wait, we had a kick and a snare. Kick and a snare, so we used three microphones. Three microphones. Yeah. But the kick and the snare were going into the same input. It was it was a mess, but we, <laughs> <laughs> I kind of I when I, anytime we go in to record there, like even if something went that wrong, I was like, we still just, we gotta, just gotta get we gotta get something yeah. recorded. We gotta we gotta make good use of our time in here. Yeah. yeah, almost every single song after like the first three that we recorded, uh, I was hearing like the finished versions of them either days before or like at most like sometimes a week before and I would listen to it at work the week following up to when I knew we were recording and the first time I would ever be actually playing the song was when I was sitting down to record the drums for it. Mm -hmm. That is true, yeah. yeah. I mean, the songs went through so many different yeah. versions, and and a lot of them would just be radically different. Like now, now people are gonna like, be listening to the album and be like, "Oh, I can tell." <laughs> <laughs> no, you can't. No, we did so many drum takes. Yeah. Like even if it was your first time playing it when you when you did the first take, like by you the didn't last hear one, the like first you knew take, you're like, no, yeah. yeah. Yeah, you know, part one, it's it's about when you die and you go to hell. I mean, <laughs> metaphorically. It's, yeah, I it's, guess I'm it's like, hard to it's hard to yeah. say like one line for what a song is about. For sure. I mean, I, I mean like I've yeah. said this before, but if I could explain in one sentence what uh -huh. is, what my song is about, then I would not need to write a song about it. For sure. <laughs> yeah, I mean like is that is that from someone else or is that a you quote? Because that's act that's that's good and something that should be in the documentary. Yeah. <laughs> That's a me quote. Okay, that's very good. I, <laughs> I can I put actually, it somewhere else in there. I actually think about my own music like, uh -huh, like that mm -hmm. now. Like if, if it's that's something, what, if it's something I can to, yeah. explain in one sentence, then I don't need to write a song about it. And that's like, that's so good. <laughs> yeah. Bedroom Community was one of the very first Glass Beach song ideas. I think it... It was an early one for It would have been 2015 that I started writing that. Wow. <laughs> okay. I remember this was when I was still working at and I I was like in the middle of like delivering a pizza and that verse melody just appeared in my head and I just recorded it on my phone. <laughs> and then I went home later and I wanted to try to put interesting chords behind it to keep the melody simple but have the chords add some depth to it and I kind of expanded on that by having it where every time that melody repeats there's different chords behind it so it's constantly recontextualizing this melody that's throughout the entire song. Yeah that was uh, that was one where we were playing a little bit of live shows before we start get, started getting into the recording pro process and that was mm -hmm. one of the first songs we were doing live. Yeah. So it's one of the first songs we ever like got down. It's one of yeah. our best songs to like like it's a song that I'm the best at. Yeah, yeah, yeah like, you on, to play on the album able to play. Like, play. When we first started playing that live, though, it was very different. Very the, different. The original version of it was it was almost like a Ben Folds ish mm -hmm. like piano rock thing. It ended up as the arrangement that it is after I got extremely into Talking Heads, mm. and I really wanted to do something like that for the verses. In fact, like some of the synth sounds on that are like, I mean, it's all using the I Prophet Five, now, yeah. which is the synth that that they used on uh, Speaking in Tongues. I want to say about Bedroom Community, the bass part is really fucking hard. The original bass line. Very cool, very technical, very, very busy. 
Yeah. And I don't even remember what it was. It was very hard for me to learn. I had to practice it a ton. Literally, when we were recording it, we had to take like 20 minutes in the middle of recording to stop and just like play the like the walking bass uh, under the piano solo. Having Jay just like comp on top of it, well, I just like kept walking as fast as I could to like get the rhythm of that down. And it, and it's still like we had to come back. The walking yeah. bass, you and I wrote that like one mm -hmm. note at a time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you were like, should it go like do 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 do? And I was like, no, it should go like do 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 do. And I was yeah. like, oh, you're right. <laughs> or wait, actually, hmm. what about that? I'm just trying to make sure that like like with the walking bass line, you usually want to hit the chord tones on the strong beats. Sure. I think like. actually one of the few things on this album that we recorded completely and then re-recorded from scratch. We ended up eventually taking the bass part that you had been playing and the one you had been playing live and just taking out a bunch of notes from it basically to leave a lot more space in the, in the mix on the verses. On the verses, William, I specifically remember telling you to play the stupidest beat possible. <laughs> I, I just wanted, I just oh, wanted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I pretty much, I pretty much do four on the floor, like just. Everything else was playing on the offbeats, and I wanted to just have some kind of metronomic rhythm in there to hold it together. Yeah, it's funny, you gave me that note, and I still couldn't stick to it. Because, mm -hmm. like, <laughs> uh, after like a moment, like halfway through the verse, like when the turnarounds come, when I'm about to do the got to, got to, got to, got to, got to, got to. Yeah. Um, I do like a little, like, uh, 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 Oh yeah, that part. Yeah, I do a little. Okay, I'll pick up. Yeah. I like what you're doing. You like that? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, I think uh, the the kind of beat where it's like boo, 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 ka, da, 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 mm, 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 ka, like where you just have like the the kick doing the eighth notes. I I would rather you use that really sparingly because okay. it's like a very. Uh, Cool, it kind of that beat kind of just like kicks your ass, yeah, you know. Yeah, it's yeah, like yeah. Do, 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 I'm using it for the second bridge for bridge two, so if I can keep it out of bridge one, that's good. Because uh -huh. um, I'd rather not play it as often as I am. Lots of question marks. How many? Um, nine question marks. Hell yeah. So this song is actually a reinterpretation of a song called Forever 
that was performed by the Little Dippers in 1960. Oh, I didn't oh, know that. I didn't okay. know that because I read your descriptions. Yes. Um, originally, the end of Bedroom Community featured a sample of not not that original version of the song, but another version of it. I sampled it, um, and I ended up deciding not to use the sample, but I did like the chords of that song a lot, so I kind of stripped it all the way down to just the chords, and then just made a little guitar piece based on those chords. But I wanted to make the forever in this be kind of uh, unsure, like, is this, it, that's why there's a bunch of question marks. It's, is this, is this good or bad? You know, it could be like forever, like really forever, or it could be like, Forever? <laughs> oh, I'm so miserable! <laughs> Oh, and when the vocals come in, they're Blue Yeti vocals that I'm going to re-record later, so cool. they're going to sound worse than this. They're going to sound worse than this? <laughs> yeah. I was ready to not play drums on this one. On Bone Skull? Well, every time you came to me and you were like, I don't know if we need drums on this one, or, or like, or if we do, I'll just program something because I have mm. something specific in mind. And I was like, oh, okay. Yeah. Um, and then I remembered like you saying at one point, oh, I mean, do you want to just put something on it? Do you want to just like try it out? And I, we were recording something else. It was while we were recording Cold Weather, I think. We finished that a lot sooner than we thought we would. And we were like, well, let's just try it. Let's just try recording drums on Bone Skull. And it it ended up sounding really good. Yeah, I really um, like my, the drum part on, on yeah. Bone Skull. It's really simple, but it like adds a nice groove there. Um, the main part of this song is based around sort of a, I guess a polyrhythm. Um, the guitar part is playing in 16th notes while the vocals are doing triplets on top of it. And the lyrics specifically uh, hit on offbeats a lot. It's supposed to create this kind of rhythmic disorientation until the drums come in. If I remember right, I think I wrote most of the lyrics to this while I was working for DoorDash in the San Fernando Valley. I think I was driving through Panorama City and just like, writing down different things that I saw, and there's a bunch of blocks of empty storefronts that are renting to nobody mm -hmm. down, around here, and I, I think I figured out recently the reason why there's so many empty storefronts there is because they're owned by some film studio and they like dress them up to look like different oh. stores for film shoots. Yeah. Just recently they turned it into a blockbuster, like a blockbuster video for Captain Marvel. Oh, oh my god, that was that blockbuster? Yeah. Whoa. We, so in a way, we sort of, Captain Marvel kind of references this album then, would you say? <laughs> it is It is a weird, uh, like, connection yeah. wow. there. <laughs> cool. Um, oh, one other thing. Hold on, I'm gonna be right back. Hey, oh, wait, 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 wait. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Or, yeah, or is it, I don't know, it's definitely delay. Um, but that's, I've only done that, like, live, because that's yeah, why I yeah, use yeah. this amp. Well, I want to hear what it sounds like. Yeah. Let's go. <laughs> Let's do it. All right. Cool Julian the Baker fucking shirt. rule. I listened to her for the first time yesterday. Oh, you're recording. <laughs> <laughs>
Afterglow was the first single from the album. It was the first song that we recorded. We recorded this a while before we recorded anything else, um, and it was recorded by my brother, Cole. I chose to use uh, theremin as the lead instrument on this song as a reference to like 1950s sci-fi B-movies. A theremin is, it's an instrument that is completely electronic that is actually the only instrument that you play without touching it at all. There's a wooden box with an antenna that sticks up and a loop that sticks out of the side of it. And how close your hand is to the antenna determines how high the pitch is, and how close your hand is to the loop determines how quiet it is. And through doing that, you can create a sound that's almost like a violin or a human voice or something. It's very common in 50s sci-fi B-movies. Mm -hmm. If you listen to any soundtrack from that era, you will hear it do like, Woo! or like, Woo! <laughs> yeah, yeah. This song was inspired by this guy, Juan Posadas, who uh, he met Leon Trotsky after Trotsky was kicked out of the Soviet Union and ended up forming a communist movement that was based around the idea of destroying civilization to rebuild it into an ideal communist society so aliens would come and, it, and like induct us into a intergalactic communist alliance. That's it is cool. wild. It is. <laughs> That's uh, dope. My my dad called me. It was before the album was out, but after we had released the single, um, and he he called me because a song came up on his like Google Play Google Music phone thing, mm -hmm. um, and he was like, and I and I listened to it and like and it and it made me cry. I didn't know why. And I looked at it. And it's because it was it was you, and I was like. <laughs> That's probably part of why you cried. Also, it's a really good song. <laughs> but yeah, he, uh, he, without recognizing what it was, this music brought my father to tears. It is, it is a sad song, or a happy song. It's an emotional song, I think, no matter what. It depends on whether you think the aliens actually did come and save us, which I would love that. Aliens would be cool. Yeah, aliens, aliens, aliens cool. Could you imagine if aliens like showed up and actually just like saved us? Yeah. Like instead of like what everyone thinks mm -hmm. is gonna happen, like they come and destroy us. It's like they're intelligent life, and they look at us and they're like, "I'm gonna spit on you." Yeah. Um, but yeah. instead, they like show up and they're like, "Oh shoot, let's help. Mm -hmm. Can we help you?" Yeah. They, they, we need aliens to adopt us. That's what we need. We need to be adopted by extraterrestrials. Yeah. When the bombs fall, take me with you. I'll keep breathing. You look so cool in the starlight. You look so cool. Oh, I need my Mexican Coke. Mexican Coke. That's the name of the album. No, it's not. <laughs> what? <laughs> Yeah, that was me. Yeah. Figure it out, let's figure it out. Neon Glow, that's fine. Okay. That's fine, that, right? Neon Glow's good. The song's about aliens and atomic bombs, and mm. it can refer to both. Uh, the uh, Cold Weather, I want to change that name. Really? I think it's boring. Okay. All right. I think it's boring, and I think lyrically it's like irrelevant. It's like, it's like, you know that song, you know that song, uh, is the song called Young Folks or Old Folks? Young Folks. You know that song? It's like, do, 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 do. there's like the guy whistling. Oh, I it's in every about. commercial. Yeah, that song is called, that song is called Young Folks. And in the chorus of the song, he's like, well, we don't care about the young folks. And it's like, why'd you call the song that? <laughs> 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 like Brandon Newman's short people. Like he named a song after the people that he that he professes to hate in the rest well, of the Well that makes world. sense because hate is more passionate than like Not just being Yeah. Like no, I, no. I I don't I don't I don't care. I don't fucking care. Then why'd you name your song that? Why'd you name your song about the shit you don't care about, huh? And you don't care about cold weather. One, three, four, five! <laughs> Cool.
cold weather uh, starts in five, ends in five, the rest of it's in four, the end. No, there's some measures of three in Okay, there. yeah, you got me. <laughs> um, cold weather, okay. The original idea, okay. The ori- okay. <laughs> <laughs> the original idea for cold weather came about because I, I realized that I had never written a love song before that wasn't like, sarcastic or like satirical or you know they didn't have some kind of irony to it i wanted to write something that was just sincere it's one of the simpler and more poppy songs in some ways but it's also it is full of time signature changes mm -hmm. and changes tempo very suddenly in the middle of yeah. it yeah, the the five four intro and outro weren't part of the song originally either. Because I you remember, wrote like, that. I wrote that because you were playing like the rest of the song. I think like mm -hmm. the beginning of it, and you're like weren't entirely sure how to start it. But I just like heard that in my head. Um, yeah. Like, da 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 da. Not even like realizing it was in five because I didn't play in like. I guess atypical time signatures until playing with Jay. Yeah, yeah. I had only ever played in four and six. Mm -hmm. Yeah or variations of that. I think what's great about that riff though is that you don't even realize it's in an odd time signature unless you try to analyze it. It just feels really unsteady, but it's good for the start of the song. It's just really mm -hmm. high energy, and then the verses are a lot more steady, so it kind of resolves that, mm -hmm. you know? I love the lyrics so much, like, or the, <laughs> the lyrical structure of that like section, the building up like section, like I didn't miss the sweater weather, I just miss you. I didn't yeah. miss Orange County, I just miss you. Like mm -hmm. just like listening to a bunch of stuff, it's just like going and it's like all these things that we have like that I had when I was with you. Uh -huh. Yeah, like like I could look back at that and be like, oh, I miss those things. It's like, no, I just miss that, that you were there with me. Mm -hmm. That's what, I love that so that, much. That is where that idea came from. I, I guess I feel that when I write songs a lot, I want to use metaphors or talk about things kind of indirectly, you know, mm -hmm. it's like, oh, I miss like the blah, 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 and the blah, blah, blah. But it's like, it's it's not it's not about the things and the places, it's about the people that mm -hmm. you're with, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I really, really don't like throwing ideas away, mm -hmm. even if it's even if it's like five, even if it's like ten years old. Like mm -hmm. if if there's some kind of merit in it, I will hold on to it until I find a good use for it. And this was an example of that. Um, there was another band that I was in that was also called Glass Beach. I know it's really confusing, but th this band existed for like one day, and I was like, that name's too good to go to waste, mm -hmm. so I brought it back for this Glass Beach. But we had one song that we wrote in that band and I wrote like four or five different guitar riffs for it. Um, like three of those riffs became all the empathy and the remaining parts became Calico. Oh, the do, oh wow. Do, do. Yeah. decision-making for um, ma making it so you couldn't understand the lyrics for the most part? You couldn't understand. <laughs> <laughs> like, um, the, just the... You know, s sometimes, like, honestly what it was is I recorded the guitar part and I just, something in my brain was like, you have to put vocoder on this. <laughs> I love the vocoder on it. I, I, I really do. I was I was listening to uh, uh, I was listening to the album, specifically that song with another friend of mine in the room. Uh -huh. And the song was playing. It came on. I was listening to the album, and I was like, oh god, I love this song so much. And <laughs> my friend was like, oh cool, cool. And like halfway through the song, they're like, you love this song? And I was like, yeah. And they're like, what is it saying? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh, I I don't know, but I love it. And and so I like I looked up the lyrics um, uh -huh. because thank you for posting them. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> and then that's when I I was like, oh yeah yeah yeah. And then I finally read the pick him up the ground, you hold him in your arms, and you kiss him on the head, and you tell him he's a lucky one. Uh -huh. <sighs> <laughs> I love that. Yeah.
Glass Beach was one of the first songs that we wrote for this album. Mm -hmm. I, I had been holding onto this for a really long time because I actually originally wrote this song for the other band I was in called Glass Beach, mm -hmm. which that would have been actually before the Cassio Dad album came out. Whoa. So the core ideas, the core ideas of this song were really, really old. And I think it originally came about because I wanted to write something that sounded like the band Snowing. So when I originally wrote this song, it was extremely hard for me to sing because I put it in standard tuning. It was in E major and it, it, most of the song was just at the top of my range, but especially when it went into the chorus, doing those really long notes really high up, it was just like wearing out my voice. So I, I was like, okay, you know what? I can sing the verses fine, the chorus is hard. I'm gonna change the key of the chorus and I'm gonna make it where the end of the verse goes through some chord changes that gradually switch it to the new key, which is a whole step lower. Mm -hmm. Then I ended up drop tuning my guitar down to D standard. So the entire song was a whole step below that. So it would be easier for me to sing the verses too. The other thing about that is um, at the end of the chorus, uh, I was on a glass beach. It, does the three and then the two, it's going down the scale like it's gonna resolve to the root. Like it should be like, glass beach, resolve down, but it never goes there until the very last chorus. So every chorus at the end has a deliberately mm -hmm. unsatisfying resolution to just yeah. delay the gratification until the last chorus. Mm -hmm. But the last chorus, while the melody resolves, the chords don't the chords get even more tense mm -hmm. and it resolves to the root while it's playing the four chord. Um, very basic music theory. Mm -hmm. There are seven notes in a scale. You can base a chord off of any of those notes. The one is the most resolved sounding. It sounds like home. Five, the five chord wants to go to the one chord. It wants to resolve it. The four chord is a little ambiguous. It can go to the four chord or it can go back to the one chord. But if you just stay on the four chord, you're in this space where you're definitely in a major key, but there's no clear movement in any direction. So it, you get this, this feeling that you're just floating or that you're moving. And I love it for that reason. So much of this song is just, just on the four chord. Mm -hmm. I get chills when the final chorus is happening and you hear all of the voices like ascending into that. I want it again. Like that part, because you I, I remember recording that and you you were like, I need you to go as high as you can and I need you to have as much power behind it as possible. Yeah. Like can you do that? And I was like, Yeah, let's go. And and listening to that part, it's like <laughs> It's so it's so funny how worth it it feels. Yeah. Because I just like I hear I and, it, and yes it's my own voice and uh, that's a little like I, I wanted to bring out the stress in it. I really wanted it to sound like you were straining. Yeah, but the, it's like so high and it just it, it it explodes out of the end of that chorus and I just like love it. It just feels really really good to be a part of a project where someone is so dedicated and like knows what they're doing to the point of of getting not only what you want to hear to happen, but something you weren't expecting that is better to happen mm. out, of, out of your own like instruments. I love playing bass on this song. I've like, I've no, it was one of the first ones that I got down and I love it. It's super fun. I, I reharmonize towards the end going up to the key change. Oh. So like I, the, the bass is like playing a part, playing apart from everything else um, kind of. And it's like, I had never, like used or like noticed bass being used that way of just like playing different notes bass to make note the chords feel different. Bass note reharmonization. Yeah. Brief like theory explanation. For some reason, I honestly don't know why, maybe somebody's explained this, but the lowest note in a chord tends to be what most affects what chord you perceive it as. Um, to the point where you can take a chord and keep all of the other notes the same but just change the lowest one and get a completely different feeling out of it. And that's what you did mm -hmm. on that chorus. And I remember listening to the demo and it hadn't like occurred to me that that wasn't the final version. Oh yeah. So like when you said that you were gonna be making a new one, I was like, no way, well, this you is can so never good. Know. This demo is so good. Um, and it ended up being so much better <laughs> mm -hmm. um, with what Jay did, but like I had no idea. 
on top of that, um, one of the last, it was like leading up to just about when we were gonna release the album or like finishing it up. Uh, I mean, and I mean like weeks, like maybe two weeks before the release and we get a new version of Glass Beach from Jay. Mm -hmm. uh, and Jay, they, they were like, hey, I remixed Glass Beach. Can you tell me if you think it's better? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, mm -hmm. now? It was though. And it, it was, was so much better. <laughs> no, I was, I, the mixes, yeah. I was working on those till the last second. Mm -hmm. Cause I cannot make myself stop doing that. Because if I keep working, it keeps getting better. Mm -hmm. So why stop? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> yep. it's true. Um, if you never stop, it'll never be done. Which is like something you've actually mentioned about the process of this album. Like with all the parts of the songwriting, like you can, you would be able to keep doing it forever. But at some point, you just needed to like stop yourself so that the album could be done. Finished is better and so than you perfect. Could hear it. Yeah, finished is better than perfect. Finished yeah. is better than perfect. <laughs> It's an ambient piece, I guess, that's an extended outro to Glass Beach. The main chord sound in there is a guitar. I made that with a guitar. I rolled down the tone really low and I put it through a flanger pedal and a reverb and some other stuff. I don't remember, a lot of effects. And then I strummed a chord with the volume turned all the way down and then turned the volume up to have it go and fade in. Part of the effect of it is having the tone knob all the way down. So you just get this like, it sounds like a UFO. That's what I love about it. Because if you turn up the tone, it sounds more guitar-like. <laughs> this song, was very intentionally put where it is in the track list to be sort of a palate cleanser and a break after Glass Beach. Glass Beach is a really long song full of a lot of guitar noise. So I wanted to contrast that by creating, I guess, guitar silence in this by recording the sounds of an amp with a cable plugged in but no guitar plugged into it. And I layered a bunch of those sounds to create some ambient noise on it. It's called Blood Rivers because that refers to veins. It's just like a really grotesque like description of it. It's about family and stuff, bloodlines, you know? Blood Rivers. But it's a very grotesque way of saying that. That's what it means. It's grotesque. <laughs> another song that was just gonna be me. I had a version for a while that was very, very ambient, very synth heavy, and then I changed the chords a little bit to make them more interesting and had the guitar part, the do, 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 and it was just gonna be that with me singing on top of it. But again, you guys convinced me to put drums and bass on it and it improved it significantly. It was very late that, I, that we put drums on it. Um, Cause yeah. I, I, I remember you had recorded bass for it and I was pretty much, I, I heard it, and I was like, yeah, that doesn't need me. 
<laughs> but but then you you show it to me and we're like, I mean, is there anything you want to do with it? We can like, because we can go into the studio and like try something out. I just like let you try playing different things on it. Yeah. And you played that that to get to get to get to get to or like on the verses. And I loved that. I love that because you took the same you took the rhythmic pulse that was already there in the guitar and you sort of played around it and made the rhythm a lot more interesting and it really helped to create a sort of drive to it that was missing with all the slow guitar and ambience and it, it really it really added a lot to it I think and then the switch into the slower beat the, it, it, yeah I love that I love that beat switch there yeah me too and that, I, that I really up. love that's like one of my favorite parts to play yeah I, like, I really really love that I wasn't originally going to be playing at all on top of like the really um, digital section, like that that was all programmed. And when we were in the practice space recording, it would get to that part and instead of stopping a recording, Jay would just like keep a recording and I would fuck around essentially. <laughs> like I was taking my toms and I would put my elbow on the tom and go from center of tom to like edge toward the rim and like when you do that like you can well it's also the amount of pressure you're putting on the tom and like be careful but yeah. um <laughs> don't just like put a hole in it <laughs> but uh that like warps the tom and like changes the tuning of it so i would do that to like i would go in and out of that as i would, so it'd be like yeah yeah, and I didn't think that stuff was gonna make it in there, and then I ended up hearing a demo of the of the song. I put it really prominently yeah, in there because it it's like such a strange feature. sound. I wanted to to uh, make it a little unclear which parts of the drums in this were digital and which parts were recorded live. And I liked that because it sounded really warped, like it was digital, but it was acoustic. Mm -hmm. And then the other part is the. Most of the drums on that part are all programmed, mm -hmm. but I wanted to kind of blur the line where it switches so that people mm -hmm. would listen to it and they'd be like, oh, the drums are getting really intense. And then, and then it's like, wait, is this even possible to play? <laughs> that was kind of the effect that I wanted to, yeah, yeah. <laughs> to get. Yeah. The, the loud part of the song is built around this hook that's a sample from a Steve Reich piece. <laughs> Six marimbas. I heard that and I was like, "This is this is so cool!" Like, just the first time I heard that, I immediately like downloaded it and was like, "I'm gonna sample this in something." Just in, in my head, I, I imagine just like going into like a city and there's just all these identical like skyscrapers just passing by endlessly. Mm -hmm. There, there's there's some there's some kind of like endlessness to it. I, I don't I don't know yeah. how to describe it. It feels like something that could repeat forever. Mm -hmm. Totally. Yeah, I, I think that song really became what it was when you decided to have that marimba, the, the that like marimba sample, be the core of the song. More yeah, than, more than it was before, because it was like you were using it as like as like accenting almost and like yeah. flavor. Um, and I remember I was in your room because you like wanted input on like what to do with it. Uh -huh. Um, and like we, we tried a bunch of stuff, but then you're just like, what if it, what if I just like start with this and build around from there? And that's yeah. what you did, and it was awesome. Yeah. I have a tendency to want to sing on top of everything, and I think mm -hmm. leaving so much of it instrumental there ended up a lot better than if I had tried to write a vocal mm -hmm. line on top of that. Speaking of vocals, the lyrics for this song are a Dada poem, and there was a Dada poet named Tristan Tazara. I think that's how you pronounce it. I think, please, I, I hope that's how you pronounce it, um, who wrote a method for how to write a Dada poem which is to take a piece of text as long as you want the poem to be, cut out every single word of it individually, put them in a hat, shake the hat, and then pull them out at random, and that will create your Dada poem. It's just supposed to be complete nonsense. The text that I had used was just a bunch of words that I wrote down that were thematically connected to the idea of the song I wanted to get across, but I specifically wanted to have something that is a little abstract and that doesn't have a clear literal narrative meaning to it that just f has more of a feeling to it you know it's uh, yeah it's funny <laughs> though because i still love the lyrics for this <laughs> Uh, 
uh, Rat, Rat Castle. Castles. Yeah, the original idea for this came from the sound at the start of the song. I have a process sometimes where I like to take some kind of simple sound like a guitar or a drum loop or something that's, you know, it's very clear what it is and put effects on it, bounce it out, put effects on that, bounce it out, just keep warping it in different ways until I have a sound that's really strange and I don't even remember how I got there and then take that and use that as the basis for a song. That's what this was. You know, I just wanted to like hit people over the head with something really weird. <laughs> yeah. The, this song makes me picture an environment more than like almost any other song on here. Like when mm -hmm. I, I, it's not necessarily a rat castle that I picture, <laughs> but like, and I can't exactly describe it, but like when I hear this song, I feel like I am in a physical space that is different than my own. And, yeah. and it's cool. Yeah. And it's weird. And it's surrounded you know? by rats. <laughs> also, I don't know, I can't see them. Those arpeggios on it, the synth arpeggio, the do 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 that that part is sampled from a song that I made like six or seven years ago, and that song is never gonna get released. But I did really like those synth parts that I came up with and ended up resampling them on this. Cool. <laughs> did you ever have rat sounds in the song? Oh, okay. There are rat songs. There are rat sounds, sounds in the song. song right there there okay. are no, there are no rat sounds in Rat Castle. There are rat sounds at the beginning of Bone Skull. I'm Lane. I'm the lead guitarist in Glass Beach. I joined the band uh, actually right about whenever the album was going to be released. Um, the band. Uh, some of the members who I work with approached me and showed me the music and I really wanted to be a part of it. It's, it's interesting to see strong musical voices from so many different backgrounds that are willing to work together and willing to like collaborate. I think that when listening to it, I also found that I, I not only related to a lot of the feelings that were in the music, but I think a thing that interested me too was the fact that I didn't relate to everything in it. Instead, some of it was was sort of a a, a new perspective slash looking glass for for me personally. What do you what do you like about being in the band so far? Um, well, number one, that everyone is is communicative and everybody is really fun to play with and it's fun to do stuff with and we're all pretty open to ideas and trying new stuff and even when there are ideas that are like we talk them out and they end up not working out it's never it's never a thing, thing that I feel is uh, being thrown out as much as it's a thing of trying to distill a better aesthetic and a better idea of what represents glass speech and becoming stronger in that plus also I mean it's the best community that I've I've personally um, I've personally been a part of musically as far as like the fans and the people we play with and meet it's one of the most supportive communities i've ever delved into and been a part of and i love it it's energizing and it's a breath of breath of fresh air along with being interesting music i'm excited just to see where where we get to go who we get to meet and the kinds of people that we get to play with because i think the coolest thing is that we uh, we in Glass Beach, very. <laughs> you want some ice cream? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we in Glass Beach. Uh, so I I think I think one of the coolest things is that we in Glass Beach are, are all just, artists at the end of the day that are not, um. That that understand that we all have different drives and all different ideas of things that we want to do and ways that we want to go about. And we're all very collaborative about that. And I think that expanding that community into something to where we can do more things with people that we enjoy, respect, and people that are just generally great human beings is is an awesome prospect because I can't, I can't tell you how much more of a positive support system and wholesome communities we need as far as music and arts in general go, you know? There's this one time that we were playing Yoshi's Island and 
Jay fixed something on the ground and then immediately jumped up and smacked their head into the microphone and fell back. And the, we just kept playing and, and Jay like, I saw Jay be like, oh, and I was like, are you okay? And they were fine. But it was, it was just really funny because it was, um, it, it's awesome to, to see the raw passion. And I mean, also just the general moments of literally just retweeting the words Glass Beach Band from like a thousand fans as a way to connect with more fans is probably both one of the most outrageous and awesome stories that I'll be able to tell about the band and how we even marketed the album in general. <laughs> I mean, you know, you know, uh, the rest of the footage has been taken before that happened. So like none of us, none of the other footage in this documentary is going to say anything about that. So, uh, isn't that weird? <laughs> that, that is, that is you weird. Are, you are the only one who is recording who knows that we actually have like a fan base now. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's wild because I mean, even, even everybody else in the band was, was surprised at how much the, the album was blowing up and everything like that. But I mean, honestly with how many like hit or miss things that have happened in, in my musical career so far it doesn't completely surprise me but it's awesome that it's happening and that it's going this far especially just because I think everybody in this band deserves it uh, they deserve it more than I can give words to honestly cool anything else you want to say um Glass Beach band listen to Glass Beach um Come to our shows, say hi, give us a hug, something. Just come and see us. chorus and chorus are in six. There's another section in the song that's like, it like alternates six and four, so it's kind of ten four. We'll go over it, but uh, but like the main parts of the song are in five and six. <laughs> This song, this song, honestly, maybe even more than part one or Dallas went through the most versions. Mm -hmm. This was one where I just constantly was like, I don't know, like, I know there's something good in there, but I can't make it sound good. And there were a lot of times where I was, I, I thought I had it. And then the next day I was like, you know what? All of that sucks. I'm starting over from scratch. <laughs> I think I did that like five times with this song. in this is that that uh, synth part that goes like do 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 you know you know what I'm talking about it's a really pretty piano part but it has like a quality to it where it hits a lot of these really dissonant intervals and it almost sounds like a like child playing a piano for the first time and just hitting random keys 
I love playing this song too. This bass line is very fun, and this is one that Jay did write. Um, yeah. I, 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 this is a bass line that Jay wrote themselves. I specifically simplified the bass line a lot because there were originally a lot of different sections in this, and I thought it would be a lot better to just have one bass line and make it the hook and keep it consistent and keep that going through the entire thing. We also used uh, tape loops on this song. My brother has a uh, tape machine like they used to use in music studios before computers existed. Um, and I recorded uh, a bit of, of uh, my brother just playing drums and we went through and played it at different speeds, reversed it, and like even just grabbed the tape and like dragged it through manually to create some weird effects. And uh, some of those effects ended up on this song. I knew that. When I was making, when I was putting together the track order for this album, I wanted to have there be a clear shift in the middle of it from right after Glass Beach to where the, the first half of it, it kind of front loads all of the more normal like punk and like poppy songs. And I wanted there to be a shift into a weirder sort of atmosphere mm -hmm. and the, the more experimental and the just, just, just have it get stranger in the second half of it. And this, this song was kind of the peak of that. I, in fact, recorded the song at a faster speed and slowed it down slightly so it would be in a key that doesn't exist. And so the vocals would mm. sound a little off kilter. I'm using that word a lot today. <laughs> um, but I, I wanted to create this is this is specifically how I thought of it. I wanted to create jazz in a liminal space. That's that's what it is. Liminal jazz. <laughs> I, I kind of envision. That's the second album. The second album called liminal jazz. I I, I not, I not subliminal, but liminal. liminal. Yeah. I didn't know how to play a bossa before we re recorded Yoshi's Island, and, and I had never successfully played a bossa until the night Jay and I sat down with uh, the recording equipment in the practice space to record the drums for that mm -hmm. song. Yeah, no, they it was it was like weeks, maybe maybe even months of them just like practicing playing a bossa drum groove on their legs yeah. every chance they could. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and that was after we played some Boston music and jazz in college, but I, yeah, like I was, you just I was, never. I was yeah. always told, uh, like our jazz instructor was like, "Hey, learn a bossa. Like, here's mm -hmm. the fundamentals of it." And I was like, "Okay, okay, cool, cool." <laughs> I'm getting ready to. I'm like practicing the bossa, like again on my lap. Mm -hmm. um, and then like the next day, I would go in and they'd be like, "Oh, we give that to a different drummer, by the way." Mm -hmm. And I'm like, "Oh, all right," because we had like several. <laughs> we had several jazz drummers, so I was yeah. just like, "Okay, I'll stick to like you know four four like what like well the t like, you know swing like." Um, and and eventually, I just like skirted by by never learning a bossa groove doing jazz, and then um, and this. then I learned it for Yoshi's Island. Learned this song wasn't band. even originally a bossa. The very mm -hmm. first version of this song was just a punk song. Like I I wasn't playing the chords like a bossa. I was like doing choppy like. <laughs>
understand I am never gonna understand I'm everything you think about her Behind her back The whole truth doesn't hurt to say You care about yourself the bass to be really repetitive to be sort of a, a foundation for it. Yeah, it's like, it is repetitive, but it's like deceivingly non-repetitive. Like there are, there mm -hmm. are points where it changes that like, if you are paying attention to it, like little bits, like throughout the course of it, which I remember you actually, Jay, set in stone. Yeah. Um, Cause like for a while I was just like kind of playing the same part and like almost was like improvising variation on it, but then you actually set in like, here's where you're gonna play this note and leave with this note instead. Yeah. Um, there is a fun, uh, the end of this song is a fun musical reference to the game that the song is named after. That is the only part about this song that has mm -hmm. anything to do with the video game Yoshi's Island, by the mm -hmm. way. Part of why I wanted to name it that is because I wanted people to wonder why it was named that. Yep. <laughs> We're talking about the <laughs> Yeah. Oh. Huh, I didn't I don't think I knew that. Yeah? Yeah, I don't play games. Yeah, it's in Yoshi's Island. <laughs> <laughs> you're you're <laughs> fucking me up. I'm trying to sing and you're like, no gonna I'm not gonna do 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 You know, that's it's catchy. It's it's pentatonic. Uh yeah. I really like the melody. You did a great job. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Cool. Orchids. Is that really how you want to pronounce it, Jay? <laughs> really? Yes. This song, I, I pretty much wrote it and we didn't change it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. There were a lot of times I was like, oh, maybe we should change it. But you know mm -hmm. what? Sometimes you don't yeah. need to. Well, it was helpful <laughs> knowing, like, always knowing it was going to end the album. Like, yes. we knew the role it had to fill. And, like, we pretty much, like, could rely on not having to change it because it kept filling that role of, like, being a good closer and, like, kind of just wrapping things up, I guess. <laughs> so, Jay gave us the structure of the song. So I'm going to be playing alone at the top. Um, and then everything's gonna come in. And it's gonna come in, I want it to be just like a hit. <sighs> like, yeah. So that, just like, that, and that stays, hit. I mean, exactly, yeah. it all stays exactly the same, just the snare hit. So that huge snare hit, just like, pop. <laughs> this is another example of me trying to do a song that goes between being loud and quiet and trying to push those two extremes as much as possible. This is probably the furthest I ever went with that because it, it's some of the quietest and definitely the loudest moments on the album are in this song. Yeah. At the second verse or whatever, uh, when it comes back down and uh, for like a moment and then there's a drum fill, it gets so hard, especially a song that's uh, structured like this, to do that part and not think, don't do Phil Collins, don't do Phil Collins, don't do Phil Collins. <laughs> um, so whenever, even when we play it live, mm -hmm. when I recorded the the, um, the studio version of it, <laughs> yeah, I was like, how can I do like a drum fill that sound like, it feels is, like Phil Collins, is but awesome. Sound. Yeah, it feels like Phil Collins, it doesn't sound like Phil Collins. <laughs> Um, and that, that was my, that was my mm -hmm. motivation for doing what I did on, on, on the record. Mm -hmm. um, and then at live, one time live I might just do Phil Collins. <laughs> do it, yeah, when, when everyone like expects not that. Yeah, That's yeah, when you yeah. have, after this has come out, yeah. but not that part you just said, then yeah. do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there you go. Uh, but the drum feels like that. It's, I'm always very nervous, and then I'm like, just keep, just do things, just do, just let your hands do things, yeah. like in your foot. Use your foot, you know? 
You don't even need yeah. to be on beat. Just like stop, <laughs> stop being loose when everyone else comes back in. And that, you're that's a compliment that Jay has given me in, in private. Um, the, the, that you said, oh, I like your fills. Um, like some of your mm -hmm. fills because you you fall out of time. You fall out of time and then like and then ramp into it uh, and go like meet on the beat. Oh <laughs> yeah. Uh, and um, and I do do that sometimes. <laughs> I think that's the take of like 99% of it. I think we don't need to record anything else. I agree. <laughs> I think, uh, here's what I think. Um, I want to use that take for everything except the very last fill, and I'm yes. going to do the very last fill from the last take, and I think that's perfect. Great. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> that last, uh, that last bit at the end of the song, where we do the ooh, yeah, ooh, that was the last thing we recorded. It was, and yeah. that was, we we recorded that just all huddled around the microphone. Do we, do we still remember right now? What is it? Oh, 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 I, oh, oh God, I oh, I don't know. Oh, I don't know. Oh, oh, I don't think we're no, I don't remember it. Oh. Very good. Very yeah, good yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for watching our wonderful show. Yeah, but we yeah we recorded that all around a single microphone, um, and I wanted it to feel live. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so there's like... no there's no effects on it or anything. I think I barely even put like EQ and compression on it. I just wanted that to sound really natural. Mm -hmm. I guess. One thing that I um, was going for with the production of the album is I wanted to have a bunch of moments in it that remind you that the album is made by people and kind mm -hmm. of show the process of it. So, for example, a lot of the songs at, at the end of it... What's up? Does the middle one stop? No, but I have to stop it. Did it stop uh -huh. recording? Yeah. Yes. Okay, cool. Cool. All right, let's get back at it. Okay. Um, so let me figure out how to start over that thought. Um, uh, what you were trying to do with uh, the production. Yeah. Ah. So with the production on this album, I wanted to create a lot of little moments in it that just keep reminding you that the album is made by humans, basically. Just, just bits of us talking in between songs or things like, um, on Yoshi's Island, you can hear you dropping Drop the, the drumsticks. Drum yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Oh. I basically I wanted to have the production be as pristine as I possibly could while keeping a bit of humanity in it, a bit of roughness and s stuff that shows the process a little bit. One one thing that going into this project that I was like conscious of, I don't know if we like talked about it much, but like. The the last like album that you had released was Casio Dad, which mm -hmm. was like all you. Yep. Um, and this is still like so much you. And like Jay wrote all the songs, and like um, we wrote William and I wrote our parts for a lot of the songs. But like this was still an album that like was being created by a band of people. So like having points where like that was like clear was like kind of I guess cool for me because I was a fan of Casio Dad yeah. which was cool and it was a cool solo project but it was also like parts in some of these songs where it's like it is guitar and bass and drums like like piano bass and drums playing like yeah. the, the piano solo feels to me like a moment where it's like oh this is a band the piano One solo person, in bedroom community the you mean? yeah bedroom community yeah yeah. Um, yeah just like taking advantage of the fact that like we didn't really get to record any stuff live i don't think but or did we for cold weather did we record that live no wasn't something we really had the liberty it was to do with it was setup, not feasible no. with no. the equipment we had that's something that i should definitely say mm -hmm. about this album is we spent zero dollars on it yeah. <laughs> yeah i mean aside from all the equipment we, we already had or, mm -hmm. or like the space we and like renting we, we the pay, practice we space. Rent but... the, we rented the practice space. That's... But that's for practice. Mm -hmm. that we, we, just, we, we rented that to practice there. originally, but we figured this is a soundproof space that we have access to every week. Yep. Um, we might as well just record it in there. So the entire album was recorded in, mm -hmm. in a practice space. And some parts in Jay's bedroom. Some parts were recorded here, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but only the parts we could get away with. <laughs> no drums. Yeah. <laughs> um, the bass parts, listening to the album, the parts of the bass, I know would absolutely not be the way that they are without Jonas. Absolutely. And there are, and then, the and, the and same with yeah. the drums. Like yeah. there are pieces like of the drums that would absolutely not be the way they are if it wasn't for me being the drummer. Uh, and that's not necessarily to say like, <laughs> like these are significant, oh, this is exactly like how it should be, but. Uh, but there's, 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 there was room for us to bring our personalities into yeah. the music. And, and even like some moments, where it wasn't our instrument playing, because Jay would always ask our feedback and opinions, mm -hmm. and like yeah. they know that we also write music, so like we were able to give ideas and stuff, and it was it was a it was as collaborative as it could be while still being like very much I think Jay's baby. I yeah I really value outside input, especially from from you guys. Like it it's important to have that because. It's so easy when you're making music by yourself to get really inside your head and to the point where you don't even know what's good uh -huh. anymore. Like, I'll listen to stuff and it's like, eh, it sounds like a song, but what should a song be? What makes a song good? You know? Yeah. <laughs> It makes it it, 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 it helps a lot to have the outside input. And Jonas, you have a real talent for like, if if I just give you like a hundred chords, taking those <laughs> and making a bass line that is a catchy melody that perfectly outlines all of them. Like, Thank you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. No, really, that, 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 that means I, when, a lot to hear. Thank you. When I do my own music, uh, or when I'm doing music with the Playgrounders or, or whoever I'm doing it with, uh, I, I write a lot of like bass lines for other people. Mm -hmm. When I do that, my, my first and only thought is I'll always, <laughs> How would Jonas play this? <laughs> How, what, what would Jonas play? How would oh? And I sometimes I come up with a bass line. I'm like, no, that's not Jonasy enough. Like, well, here's the thing: if you do take that approach to writing bass lines, you'll always have fun playing bass. So yeah. Okay, let me talk to you about genre, okay? Music genres do not mean what they used to mean in music. Back when there were record stores, when that was where you would get music from, genres were important because you could easily find stuff that was similar to stuff that you liked before because they categorized it like that. So, so genres came from music stores, but they also were very tied to specific cultures and places and scenes. You know, if you lived in one city, punk music would be different from if you lived in another city and, you know, so on with, with every genre. They were very specifically tied to places. Now, since people get music from the internet, music has very little ties to any specific place mm -hmm. and genre is just another like thing in the metadata on it that's just another descriptor of it yeah it doesn't it doesn't mean what it used to mean like it used to separate different groups of people but now now yeah it's it's just another description of the music mm -hmm. and i want to embrace that in music because I, I i think there is a lot of common ground that can be found between really disparate genres and i think that's a really interesting space to explore and to kind of blur the lines. And the thing is, I just like all kinds of music. Right. So why would I you only want to make them, one kind of music? Like yeah. I, I like music from like every genre that exists and like, what was I gonna say? <laughs> I mean, you write what you like, right? You write what you're listening to, uh, to some degree. So like yeah. it, makes sense that like your music that you write would be as eclectic as what you listen to. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I try to, like, I will give any kind of music a chance and I, if I, even if I'm listen, like, even if I hate a piece of music that I listen to, I, there's always something I can learn from it. Mm -hmm. Like, even if it's like, I listen to this and it's like, this is the worst music I've ever heard. Then I have to think why, mm -hmm. like what about this fails to appeal to me? And, and then you just do the opposite. Yeah. <laughs>
I knew I wanted to have some kind of like plants and some sort of like natural scene going on, but it didn't really have a whole lot of um, direction immediately. So I drew a bunch of plants, kind of narrowing in the flora I wanted to capture. We've got some orchids, we've got some sky here, some lupines, which are uh, the other flower that you can see in the album art. Um, they have these beautiful uh, leaflets that just kind of look like fireworks to me in a way. This one was wolfsbane. I'm sorry, this is not a lupine, but I played with the idea of including it. Didn't make the final cut. Sorry, wolfsbane. You can see I've got these kind of really like oddly colored, like sort of natural color for a flower, but then you get into the blue of the leaves and you're like, okay, what's going on? So the I wanted a sort of alien palette on some earthly plants, kind of give it a ephemeral sort of feel. So here I have like literally the very first thumbnail sketch. It's so itty bitty, but you can already see a lot of the design elements coming into focus here. We've got the red sun or moon, whatever you want it to be. We've got some kind of like ocean situation happening. We we're actually playing around the idea of having it printed on clear vinyl so that way you can see a CD inside. And you even have like a prototype sort of of the uh, cuttlefish alien creature that you see on the album art's final design. You see I was already playing with um, different materials, just trying to see if I wanted a watercolor to be the direction that I wanted to take the, the medium in. And I ended up still using some watercolor, but the majority of the painting was done with uh, gouache, which is uh, kind of like a more opaque sort of graphical watercolor, so, sort of similar, but um, I was already using the gouache here on the sun. As you can see, that one's a lot more like bold of a color. The paints that I chose actually, um, I had already owned previously and they just happened to kind of be really close to the colors that we had for the palette. Um, so that worked out really well. Here is the watercolor paper that I use, it's hot press. So it's uh, nice and smooth, um, which is what I really wanted for the, the final pieces. And once I kind of finally got all the elements that I wanted put together, I just started just painting the scene. I actually, as you can see here, it's on two separate pieces of paper. So I kept the really detailed like line art painted part of it on one paper so that way everything on that page I could get as like detailed as I needed to get you know I'll get all these like wild uh, natural organic shapes and things twisting and turning and I can also have a really nice kind of sea here um, and still have all that detail in the water and the the choppiness of the waves and the the really like fine detail like this really thin red line uh, of the the light reflected off the surface of the water on the horizon there once they were both done uh scanned kind of just plopped them on top of each other digitally and it it worked out really well and i actually uh scanned the line art of this uh before I painted it, just in case like something went horribly wrong, you never knew. And uh, the way that it shifted ever so slightly off center, um, you get this sort of chromatic aberration. I don't know if it's glary or not. You can kind of see where the lines sort of separate there. And I, I really liked the effect, so we kept it. I had the, the benefit of being able to listen to the album in its entirety, in its pretty much completed form. Uh, you know, a couple tracks were getting tweaks kind of down to the last minute, um, but I had access to um, all the music and pretty much just listened to it on loop, on repeat, uh, just while I was working on this. And so it really got to the point where I was basically making like fan art for the music, like before the music was even released. So it's a scene that's ambiguously set, 
Uh, you can, can't really tell whether it's night or day or if this is even really Earth or if that's a sun or a moon, you know, what's going on here? Who knows? Uh, stream the first Glass Beach album. <laughs> I'll, I'll ask individually, Jonas, first. Mm -hmm. What is the album about? <laughs> um, fuck, man, I don't know. Like, th <laughs> there is an aspect of the album that, to me, feels like it is about, like, connections between people. There's, yeah. like, there, there's a lot of, like mention of like different ways that people like communicate and exist together I guess um, so I almost want to say like community if anything yeah. which also kind of ties <laughs> into like bringing all these influences together into one thing and there's a song bedroom community but like uh -huh. so I guess if I were to pick like a word as what the album is about probably community that's a good that's a good one okay um, <laughs> well so I've actually put a lot of thought into this because yeah. I, I like read your your liner notes and stuff Mm -hmm. and everything you put on Bandcamp. So, like, sort of my perspective of what I, of what I think the album is about, I, you, I mean, you said yourself it's about kind of, like, the world at large and, like, existing in it. Yeah. But I, I see it more, and maybe this is because I know a lot of the behind the scenes, but uh -huh. I see this album as being about, like, sort of an idea of maturity, <laughs> both, like, musically and the way that you interact with the world around you and also the maturity of the world around you. So not only the growth of you as a person, but the growth of like the world and society and how you interact with each other. And like the realization that you can't process or perform the same way that you used to. And it's important to move and grow in a direction that is either scary or new or um, eclectic or like based in a community so that you can find a safe way to grow with people who will be supportive and uh, and critical in, in really like um, positive ways. Yeah. And then sections of it um, in that maturity, realizing that you still need to give yourself room to be, to play mm -hmm. and and to revert back to ideas of, of nostalgia or, yeah, or she's like other things like that. What do you think the album's about? What do I think it's about? Um, the first Glass Beach album by Glass Beach is about Glass Beach. Um, it's about itself. No, I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, God, what is it about? I don't know. Every song is about a different thing. The whole, yeah. I, I will say the whole album, like there was a point where it was going to be like a concept album. Like it was going to be about one thing, but I... Honestly, a lot of what I was going for and how I put it together is I wanted to, like, deny it a consistent narrative. Like, I want to embrace chaos and, mm -hmm. like... That really comes through because I've had several experiences where I've had people uh, get a hold of me mm -hmm. that have listened to the album in, in its entirety, and someone will say, like... Oh, it feels like so disjointed, mm -hmm. um, and and it's like it's interesting, like how much like skipping around it feels like it's doing. It's really cool, uh -huh. and then I'll hear from someone else who's like, "This is the most cohesive album mm -hmm. I've, <laughs> I've heard in a long time." Like start yeah. to finish, they were like, "You." Like, it's like it is an album where like I almost can't stand listening to it out of order or, mm -hmm. or anything. Which I, like I, I really appreciate that that is the kind of album it is because that's the yeah. kind of album I like. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think there was a time where I thought that concept albums were the most genius thing ever, and I'm not as... I mean, there's there's good concept albums. There are very good concept albums, but it's not something I'm interested in following as strictly mm -hmm. now. Only and one? Black Parade. Black Parade. Black Parade, yeah. <laughs> Only one. <laughs> not 21st um, Century Breakdown? Two. <laughs> <laughs> um... Why would you say that and not American <laughs> Idiot? Exactly. That's why. Yeah. Um, That's the joke. I, I think I, I think I touched on this in the in the liner notes, but um, a lot of the experience that I wanted to the album to have was was to kind of embody the world as it is now, and part of that is that I feel that now we don't take in information in clear 
narratives anymore. There's no, you know, there, there, there's no narrative of like, we are doing everything for the better of mankind, like prove how good mankind mm-hmm. is or for power or to defeat the enemy or something. Mm-hmm. Instead, like, it's like, um, we'll get just streams of completely disparate information. You know, you scroll through Twitter or Facebook uh-huh. or whatever, and it's like somebody's like, oh, that movie you like is bad. And then the next thing is like 10,000 people murdered. And then it's like, mm-hmm. <laughs> then you get whiplash. You get whiplash. There's so much information and there's it. there's no order to it at all. And that was the feeling that I wanted to embody with it. Yeah. I think you do. <laughs>